Our topic today is synodality, specifically Pope Francis's legacy of synodality. We're delighted to have our speaker, uh, Austin Ivory, who you'll hear more about in a minute. He's joining us from the United Kingdom. I said good afternoon to you, but I need to say good evening to him because it's evening there. Thank you so much, uh, Jim, for that very generous introduction and how lovely it is to be with you tonight. I don't know whether it's cold and wet like it is here in in Pittsburgh, um, but I know there are always alternatives of an evening. And so I'm very grateful to you for, for coming tonight, for, for tuning in. And the topic I've chosen for this talk is synodality as Pope Francis's greatest or most significant legacy. And I realize that I'm setting myself up there because, of course, this is a pontificate which will uh -huh. be has been much talked about for the last 10, 11 years and will continue to be. Uh, and there will be many things that people believe uh, this pontificate has been responsible for. So I want to make an argument tonight. It's a case. It's an argument. Uh, and the argument is this, that by reinvigorating the ancient practice, praxis of synodality in a radical way appropriate to our time, Francis has created a vehicle for the church that will allow it, us, to navigate the difficult transition to a very different era in Christian history. And I want to say that it's going to be his, seen as his greatest legacy because this transition is vital and it is urgent. And that's why Francis said in that famous speech in 2015, in October 2015, when the world's bishops were gathered for the second family synod in Rome, he said famously that synodality is what God is asking of the church in the third millennium. And, you know, it's easy to hear a phrase like that and go, yeah, that's kind of the kind of things popes say. Actually, they don't say that kind of thing very often. When a pope says that, it's coming from deep within him. And this is what I want to offer you tonight is a little bit of what I would call the deep background to this synodal journey that the church is on. If you like, why has it come from Francis, the Latin American church? Why this pope? Why now? And so what I want to really get across tonight is that this is coming from a, a place of very deep discernment within him, the discernment of the signs of the times, and not just his own personal discernment, but that of Aparecida, which was the shrine in Brazil where the Latin American bishops gathered in May 2007 for the first continental episcopal meeting in 25 years. And there they carried out what I consider to be, and nobody's yet contradicted me, the th profoundest discernment of the signs of the times that was going on anywhere in the church and has since, I think, been unmatched or unequaled. Now, that meeting, that gathering of the delegates of the Episcopal conferences, the, the, the council organized by CELAM, the Council of Latin American uh, uh, Bishops, uh, was, uh, of course, the key figure at that meeting. Uh, he wasn't the president or the general secretary of Selam, but by all accounts, the moving spirit, if you like, of Aparecida was, of course, Jorge Mario Bergoglio. So I'm, I don't in any way discount his own role in Aparecida. But on the other hand, to say that this isn't just coming from him, this was, if you like, the great fruit of that meeting of Aparecida. And so from the very beginning of the Francis pontificate, right there in March 2013, actually, when we look back, it's quite clear now that this was always going to be the program. But Francis being Francis, he let it out gently, didn't always show what he was doing. But he did say very clearly in 2014 that he wanted to move patiently but firmly in the direction of what he called the synodal church of which Cardinal Martini had dreamt, Cardinal Martini, the famous Jesuit Archbishop of Milan. So he said this, and he said other things, and I've recorded them in, in, in my second uh, biography, Wounded Shepherd, I kind of go into this a bit, but it's true that actually not many of us were paying attention, or maybe not many of us really realized what he was talking about, because of course, as a church, we have lost the capacity to be synodal. Uh, the, the characteristics of the early church were lost uh, over time, particularly in modernity. So if you like, he was referring to something of which we hadn't yet had much experience. But now, after five synod assemblies in Rome, 
And of course, now in the final year of the Synod on Synodality, I think we are, of course, so much more aware of what synodality is, even if, of course, so many people remain on the margins of it, indifferent, even hostile. But I think very few people would say now that this isn't important. Everybody, I think, has a sense that this is a tremendous development within the life of the church. Now, before I go on, uh, because I tend to rush into things and, and, and it all comes out in a great torrent, and I've been told I'm a signpost better. So I'm just going to signpost briefly what I'm going to do in my time. I'm going to offer an account in the first part of what Francis calls in Spanish, el cambio de época, the change of era that we are now in his discernment undergoing. So I'm going to spell out in, in briefly brief terms the crisis of particularly the Western church, which is which he perceives the new era that the spirit is calling us into and the mindset and the attitudes that this is going to require of us. And I want to make particular use. Obviously, by the way, after this talk, the first book you should be buying uh, is the one already mentioned, First Belong to God. But if there's anything left in your book budget after buying that, then I would strongly urge you to buy a book which is just out this week in English by Tomasz Khali the Czech priest prophet, many of you will know his writings. And he's got, I think, a remarkable book called The Afternoon of Christianity. And I'm going to refer to that book in the first part because I think it brilliantly articulates the nature of this shift for which I believe synodality is preparing us. So the first part is going to be about explaining that change of era and what it calls for. And secondly, I'm going to explain how I think synodality and excuse, you know, it's, everybody knows it's an ugly neologism, but it's a key word, sin hodos, how the, the recovery of this muscle that we've, as it were, that has atrophied in the Western church is essential for allowing us to transition to this new era, which Francis talks about and Halik has articulated. The mindsets, attitudes and practices, if you like, that we, we need to evangelize a post-secular or post-modern world. And the final third part, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've seen this synod on synodality develop and where I think it's taking us. And you'll realize by the time I get there that I'm not one of those who thinks that synodality is primarily about certain structural or doctrinal changes, even though, of course, they will be part of it. They're already, in a way, part of it. They will flow from it but I think they will flow from what is happening upstream. They are downstream of what is happening upstream. And upstream, and what, this, what the heart of this synodality journey is about, is a transformation of the church's internal culture. It's about a deepening spirituality, which is summed up in the notion, and I'll explain this, of self-transcendence, or what Francis in his user-friendly Spanish would talk about, salir de sí mismo, salir de sí coming out of ourselves. So that's what I'm going to do. The first part now, the change of era. You may remember the famous short speech which Cardinal Jorge Mario Begoglio gave to the cardinals prior to the conclave of March 2013. Jesus inside the door, not knocking on the outside of the door, asking to be let in, but on the inside of the door, of the sacristy in particular, asking to be let out. And contrasting the self-referential, as he called it, church, to the one that lives, as he said, from the sweet joy of evangelizing, which goes out to the peripheries and which is led by the spirit. Now, the phrase he used there wasn't to go out, but to go out from itself. And this is really key. And it's been, I think, unnoticed and it's been very poorly translated in Vatican documents. But the phrase he used was salir de sí misma, to go out from itself or herself. Now, not many people know that there is a backstory to these remarks. These remarks that he made, those famous little speech which persuaded so many of the cardinals to vote for him. He had already given a very similar image and account, not in a speech, but in a homily at the meeting of a parasida, which I referred to earlier in May 2007. It was a homily with the image of, just as he used in March 2013, of the church as like the woman paralyzed in the gospel of Luke, right? So she can only kind of look down. And he offered in this homily a really compelling account of what it means to come out of ourselves or of the church to come out of itself 
in response to the action of the Spirit. So really the whole homily is about how the church depends on the action of the Spirit. And he describes how it is the Spirit that frees us from all self-sufficiency. And here's a quote, a spirit that by pushing us out to evangelize, to evangelize, frees us from becoming a self-referential church. And then he goes on to say, like the stooped woman of the gospel who does nothing but look at herself while the people of God are somewhere else. This is what he said in Aparecida. Now, to me, this is a really key phrase because it identifies the crisis of the church above all in the Western world as one of institutional self-referentiality, in which, if I can put it crudely, the institution has withdrawn from the people rather than the people leaving the institution. Now, I want to emphasize this wasn't a theological lecture. He wasn't presenting an argument. In fact, when you read the, the homily, and it's collected, by the way, in this, uh, in this book of his, of his homilies and speeches uh, from his time in Buenos Aires, if you read it, it's very clear that he was we would say, caught, in, caught up in the spirit when he gave this homily. I mean, you can just tell the whole way in which he's expressing himself. And it is a hymn to the Holy Spirit that everything we are and do in the church is a fruit of the action of the spirit. Everything that we do to evangelize when we, when we offer Christ and so on. That The worst thing we can do is not depend on that spirit. The worst thing we can do is to try to depend, as it were, on our own strength and our own actions what in his conclave speech he called living from our own light rather than reflecting the light of Christ. So, as I say, this is an insight. I'm not presenting anything sophisticated theologically here. It was a, a spiritual insight, a discernment of what's happening. You know, he looks at the reality. And, of course, in Aparecida, what they were discussing was the difficulty of the church evangelizing contemporary modernity. They saw all around them the evidence of secularization, but more importantly, they saw within their own ranks the difficulty in, uh, in uh, the difficulty of transmitting faith in the traditional way via institutions and via the family and so on. So what he was presenting here was a diagnosis, a spiritual diagnosis. Now, what I find really interesting, and the reason I mention this, is that the bishops at Aparecida, I've heard this from more than one of them, after Cardinal Bagoglio gave that homily, the bishops clapped, which is, you know, is pretty unusual, first of all, after a homily, and secondly, for a group of bishops to do. But they clapped. In other words, what he said deeply touched them and deeply moved them. And interestingly, in March 2013, when he used that same image to the cardinals, many of them would say later they believed that the spirit had already chosen the next pope. So I want to say that this is something very significant here. This is a spiritual, a deep spiritual diagnosis, which in all my kind of years of researching and following Francis, I keep coming back to as being an essential move. It's a move. It's a movement, if you like, we would say, uh, of the spirit. Now, I mentioned the homily also because there's one other thing in that homily that I want to draw your attention to. And he says this, and I'm going to quote, because we do not want to be a self-referential church, but a missionary church, we do not want to be a Gnostic church, but a worshipful and prayerful church. And then he says this, people and shepherds making up this holy, faithful people of God and enjoying the infallibilitas in credendo, all together with the Pope, the people and the pastors. We enter into dialogue as the Spirit inspires us and we pray together and build the church together. Better still, we are instruments of the Spirit who builds it. And then he goes on to ask the, the Lord Jesus, together with Mary, to send us the spirit that he says will open the way for us to the evangelizing dispersal that will foster in us that beautiful dialogue between the people and their pastor. Slightly strange language, because whenever sponsors is translated, it comes out strangely. But, um, but, but this, this seems to me absolutely key, because this is what Francis means by self-transcendence and opening up to the spirit in a dialogue between people pastors and the pope the people of god the pope the pastors together discerning listening discerning listening to the spirit a key phrase now remember he's saying this in 2007 without ever imagining presumably that he will be pope but this is in a sense the program now, a policy that does something, I think, very significant. It offers a diagnosis of the signs of the times. 
it understands this shift, which they call the change of era. And that shift is basically about the fact that the church can no longer rely on culture and law, nor strong institutions to transmit the faith, because these transmission belts are frayed and broken. And the evidence of that, even then, was everywhere around. It's even stronger today. And they came to understand that the key dimension of evangelization of the church of the future was, would, would be a bit like in the early church, the experience of the encounter with Christ, which is always an experience of the mercy of God. So the question then becomes how, as it were, does the church arrange itself so as to be able to offer always that primary experience, which then opens the door to, if you like, Christian faith and the acceptance of the, of the truth of Christian doctrines. But without that encounter, that, uh, that there simply will be less and less hold or grasp of what Christianity uh, means. And of course, this is, becomes the program of Evangelii Gaudium. But what I want to stress is not the importance of their diagnosis, although I do think it's significant. What I want to stress is the spiritual disposition that's involved in this. And I call it in Wounded Shepherd, a choice to discern and reform rather than lament and condemn. So faced with change, faced with turbulence, faced with crisis, with secularization, with diminishing congregations and shortages of vocations, how do we as a church respond? And the lamentation and condemnation is a self-referential response. We condemn modernity, we lament what's happening, we dream of going back to a golden age. And you'll notice that in all of these lament and condemn reactions, the one thing we never do <laughs> is invite the spirit, as it were, to tell us what it is that we need to do. So the discern and reform option, what I call the aparecida option, I, re I, re I read an article in response to Rod Dreher's Bene Benedict option. I said, well, there's actually, there's an aparecida option. The aparecida option is to say, what is happening? And what is the spirit asking of us? How must we change in order to evangelize this contemporary situation? And it seems to me that of all the churches in the world, and particularly in contrast to the church in the USA and in Europe, where it seemed to me that lamentation and condemnation was so much the default response to secularization, what Francis and the Latin American church is doing here seems to me absolutely crucial to choose to discern and reform. So, if you like, the whole pontificate of Francis flows out of this recognition of the change of era and the recognition that the church itself has to change. And hence we have the program of Evangelii Gaudium. But it also keeps coming back to this idea of salir de si, coming out of itself. Remember the choice in St. Augustine's City of God, you know, the two kinds of love, the love that closes in on itself and the other kind of love which opens itself up to God and to, indeed to others. Francis says it in the lovely forward that he's written to me for this retreat. This is not a time to hunker down and lock our doors. I see clearly that the Lord is calling us out of ourselves to get up and walk. Now, Halleck's Afternoon of Christianity. He talks about, of course, the crisis in the Western church, which is, by the way, not just about a lack of vocations. <laughs> It's also about a lack of people in my diocese here. Uh, we've been looking at the statistics recently and it's very, very, very dramatic. And just since COVID, we've lost about a third of our congregations and they're not coming back. And behind all this, and this has come out very strongly in the Synod, there is a collapse going on, a collapse of a model. And let's call it for the sake of argument, and I'm sorry to, that the term you know, is crude, but let's just call it a clericalist model, the juridical clericalist model, the form of Catholicism associated above all with modernity, especially from the 16th century Council of Trent through to certainly to the Vatican Council, in which, if you like, the spiritual and governing authority is concentrated in the priesthood and that the church is associated above all with the juridical institution. That model is collapsing. It is no longer sustainable. We had a, a bishop stand up in the assembly last October who said that since he had been ordained, he was a European bishop, he had buried 300 priests and ordained 15. A bishop in Africa followed that by saying in his diocese, where, by the way, you know, plenty, of, plenty, of, um, plenty of baptisms, you know, church growing, and yet tiny numbers of priests to manage a huge area. 
So the idea that the model that many of us of a certain age at least have grown up with the post-war kind of model is collapsing. And I don't think I need to say any more about this because it's obvious. Now, Halik would say that John Paul II and Benedict brought to a close the long period of the church coming to terms with modernity. In other words, Catholicism as, if you like, a counter narrative to liberal humanism and scientific rationalism. But we're now living in a postmodern or post-secular, whatever we want to call it, era in which both institutional doctrine-based Christianity and dogmatic atheism are in crisis, in which the competitor is not atheism or those ideologies, but rather the nuns, the so-called nuns, the ones who take none of the above when asked what religion they are. The nuns are now the fastest growing element or religion, if you want to call it religion, in certainly in Western society. Uh, they are the spiritual seekers, deeply suspicious of institutional Christianity, but they are not atheistic, necessarily at least, most of them aren't, but they would describe themselves as seekers. Halik would describe them in a previous book as like Zacchaeus in the gospel, looking, if you like, from, a, from the safety of a fig tree, but not opposed. Key to the future of Christianity, says Halik, is this capacity to accompany and enter into dialogue with these nuns, with the seekers, the searchers. And that requires of the church that we become ourselves, if you like, more like seekers and searchers. He calls this a third ecumenism, if you like, the two other ecumenisms being the dialogue with other Christians, the dialogue then with other religions. This is the third kind of ecumenism to which he believes the church is now called. And of course, the figures are compelling, even in the United States, which has been traditionally far more far less secularized than Europe, the nuns now make up about a third of the population and are growing fast. Here in Europe, the nuns are now overtaking uh, the major religions. In Swiss Switzerland's become the first country where it actually has more nuns than the next biggest category, which would be the Catholics. So this is, this is a huge uh, a trend that's happening right now. And the temptation faced with this change is what Francis would identify as self-referentiality or ecclesiocentrism, a displacement of the centrality of, of Christ uh, and to make the church itself, if you like, the object. So this is about a certain kinds of apologetics, certain kinds of proselytizing. It's about a certain kind of corporate managerial approach, which we see particularly, I have to say, in the church in the United States, but also uh, in Germany a worldliness, a triumphalism, and so on. Now, these would be signs for Francis and for Halik of what I might call the temptations in this time of transition. And especially because they are about an attempt to cling to power, because at the heart of this shift that we're undergoing is a changing relationship of the gospel, or the church, I should say, with power. Yeah. So in this era, which is above all an era of technocratic power, the church is called more and more to witness to a very different kind of power, which we might call kenotic, or the power of the, the power of mercy, the power of forgiveness. And yet we see around us, particularly at the moment, the rise of traditionalism and Christian nationalism above all in your country, but also plenty of it over here in Europe. These are, of course, attempts to recover what is lost, a sense that we need to recover power. These would be seen for both Francis and Halik as the bad spirit temptations, because actually what we're being invited to is in a very different relationship with power. Halik calls this Catholicism without Christianity, and we're seeing plenty of it at the moment. Clericalism, legalism, moralism, fundamentalism, a kind of mercilessness, which you see in particularly certain kind of rad trad uh, Catholics, fundamentalism and fanaticism. And in contrast to this, what we're being called to and what we're seeing emerging from the synod is a call to a deeper spirituality which is a call in a sense to recover our true identity which doesn't lie in a particular system of doctrinal or institutional structures but is a seeking of the god who is always beyond us and outside us and to assume the past not to disown it this isn't about abandoning the catholic tradition it's about entering more deeply into the true catholic tradition which is always to be open to the new things that we're being brought by the spirit in every new age in a discerning way but what it requires of the church is above all discernment and dialogue and this is why synodal conversion is so key halik would suggest four ecclesiological concepts as guiding principles 
the church as the people of God journeying through history, the church as a school of wisdom, helping people to search for the truth, accompanying them in their journey of searching. The church, famously, as Francis said, as a field hospital, offering the, the, the mercy of God, the healing power of God. And the church is a place of encounter and conversation, of accompaniment and reconciliation. And what's so interesting when I put this together, when I put Khalik together with Francis's diagnosis, and I look at what's emerging from the synod on synodality, I see the same thing. I see this emerging. So there's something happening here, which is important. So, part two, why is synodality the necessary vehicle to take us into this new era? So, Halik would say that the true identity of the church, the, sorry, the big risk for the church right now in this period is to focus on an illusion that we're already there, that we're already at the goal. This is a temptation, by the way, both of progressives and of traditionalists. Yeah, there's a certain kind of progressive tendency to say, oh, if only we make this change and we change that doctrine and we allow, you know, ordination of wizard, somehow this all resolves it. It's the temptation, if you like, of the German process we can come back to in the Q&A. But actually, the key of synchodos, of this idea of journeying together in response to the spirit, is that we are on the road. It is a, it is a state of being. It is, a, it is a journey on which we are constantly being called because we are constantly growing. And that's why the call to develop the mindset and the practices of synodality are so important. It is the search, if you like, for the new cultural home of Christianity, because at the moment the church has become, in many ways, excuse me, excuse me, in many ways has become uh, homeless uh, culturally. So it is a call then to, to, to discover these methods, these means to, to, uh, 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 that are about accepting this fluidity, about accepting this uncertainty. Christ entrusted us with a mission and the mission is going to constantly demand, it's going to constantly demand a different format and structure. Excuse me a second. I don't have my do not disturb on, but my mother is an exception to it, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, so uh, uh, this, this seems to me absolutely key uh, to what the synodal journey is about. Some people may say synodality is an ugly term or a term that has no meaning for us in the contemporary world, but it's good Greek. It's like diakonia or kenosis. It expresses a key concept which is not available in secular equivalents. So what is the crisis telling us? Well, krisis, another good Greek word, means choice. Uh, what is it that we are going to choose to do? Halik tells the story of an old lady who protests to her parish priest that she's disappointed in God because for three decades now she's prayed to win the lottery and God hasn't answered her prayers. But God has answered you, the priest tells her. The answer is no. Ever since I can remember, we've been praying for a springtime of vocations for a, a, a recovery of this model. But could it be that God, as it were, has already answered us? Could it be that the answer is no, that we need to open ourselves now to what the Spirit is already doing in the leadership of women, in the growth of the lay vocation, alongside priests, not instead of them, and rather not look to a model which is seeking to shore up what I might call the mourning of Christianity. And this is difficult sometimes for people to hear, who are invested in a particular model or an idea. But what I've learned in the Synod is that to be attentive to the new things that the Spirit may be doing, and that may be very different from the ones that people believe. What happens in a synodal process is what first happened in Acts chapter 15, when the church was also faced with a profound crisis, its first major crisis. Jesus is not there to give them the answers. So they gather and they listen to the experience above all, and they work out what the Spirit is saying to them through that experience to realize what the Spirit is doing. One of the signs of our times is a growing multipolarity within the church. This is the powerful new reality of a global church, just as we no longer live in an unipolar or bipolar world, but a multipolar world. So now the church is made up of these very strong centers, you know, it's no longer the Western church with a, with a mission. to. Yeah, this was very obvious in the Synod Assembly in October. Same numbers of bishops roughly from Africa, 
from Latin America and from Europe, you know, pretty much the same numbers of bishops in all those three continents. And the African bishops saying very strongly in the synod, you know, to the West, your experience is not our experience. Your priorities are not our priorities. Listen to us. How do we reconcile in a multipolar church the very different cultural experiences of things like, for example, as we've seen on sexuality and marriage, for example, gender and so on? How do we create communion from these tensions that are ne that are inevitable in a global multipolar church? And how does synodality enable us to reconcile also the divisions within the church between which are growing all the time, the polarizations between progressives and conservatives and so on? So I want to suggest five ways. First, it makes concrete the church as firstly the assembly of the whole people of God in which all are equal in dignity by virtue of baptism and therefore all called to take part in the life and the mission of the church. And I've seen for myself in the synod how people have come to understand themselves by being involved in synodal processes. They've come to see themselves in relation to the church in a new way that the church is no longer simply the institution out there that I go to, I might like or I might dislike, but rather I am part of the church. The church is me. This is my family, my community, in which I am a valued member. Secondly, it allows the people of God to be subjects, not just objects, of the church's action and teaching. The Pope describes this as a church of mutual listening in which everyone has something to learn the faithful people, the College of Bishops, the Bishop of Rome, each listening to each other and all together listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit through and by listening to each other. And it is very striking how the Pope keeps coming back to this conviction that the people of God have this kind of infallibilitas in credendo, that there is the Spirit is speaking through the experience of the people of God. And I'm very struck, for example, by one of the signs in this synod, how, how people are asking to be seen, recognized, to be heard. You know, the emphasis on integration, on inclusion, on, on, on listening to the people who are outside uh, seems to me a very strong sign of the times which the Spirit is pointing us to. Thirdly, it teaches discernment above all by the means of spiritual conversation. Spiritual conversation has emerged as the celebrity method of the synodal process. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but you know, it involves three rounds. And in the first two rounds, we are just listening to each other. There is no discussion, but there is lots of silence. And we're listening to the resonances in our hearts of what others are saying. It's been used throughout the synodal process. It was used very powerfully for the first time in the synodal assembly last October, and I was there and spoke to people every day, and they were deeply, deeply struck by it, that they understood through spiritual conversation, you know, why people believed what they believed. It really did open their horizons. They may not, dis they may not, they may have disagreed with somebody, but they'd come to understand, you know, what was going on in, in that person when they said it, uh, but also to reveal the agendas and the power plays and so on. Conversation in the spirit as a powerful means of collective group discernment that purifies our intentions, that teaches people also to offer their experience as a gift rather than trying to push an agenda and persuade others, but to say, here's what I think, here's what I believe from my own experience, this is my own discernment, and to present it as a gift to others, which is then taken up you know, as part of a group process. So fourthly, and very much related to this, synodality teaches us the habits and virtues of communion, which we so badly need in our church, but also in our society. We need to understand what it means to belong to a body. Virtues such as patience and humility, uh, such as the importance of identifying convergences and consensus. What it means to be to have a census ecclesia, to defer to the wisdom of the body rather than seek to promote my view or to oppose another view. <clears throat> so realizing that coming to a common mind isn't just about a rational agreement, but it's also a disposition of the heart. And that synodality teaches that disagreements and tensions don't have to be resolved. There isn't necessarily, the answer isn't necessarily A or B, but actually A and B can perhaps coexist and be held together until perhaps a sea appears, a new horizon 
in which the spirit, as it were, shows us something beyond both of our positions, which includes the best of both of our positions. In other words, the truth isn't something that I grasp and impose, but that we seek together. And when I feel disappointed at the result of a synodal process, do I really believe that my own discernment is superior to that of the body? All of this has to be learnt by doing it and by experience, and this is what the Synod on Synodality is doing for us. And so finally, the Synod is putting us or putting church authority on a whole new foundation of legitimacy, precisely in a moment when church's authority is deeply discredited for the obvious reasons, not just because of the scandals and so on, but because of the way in which our society now relates to authority and relates indeed to people who claim the truth. So much of the, the, the seekers and the nuns you know, their response to certainty is to see it as an imposition or as an attempt to lock me into an iron cage. And therefore people, as it were, need to see how the church comes to believe what it believes. And therefore we need processes like the one we've been experiencing these last two and a bit years. And it's a very, very striking thought that when the next conclave takes place, and you know, I hope it's a long way away, but when it takes place, that next conclave will take place against the background of the biggest consultation of the people of God in human history. And one of the most profound processes of ecclesial discernment that the church has ever witnessed. And that every cardinal going into that conclave will understand what the spirit has been saying through the people of God. So a whole new way of understanding authority. So let me conclude. Where is the synod on synodality taking us? Well, I think it's showing us a vision of the church in the afternoon of Christianity. We are now entering, or as far, far as Halleck would say, we are leaving the long midday of modernity, the long darkness, the dark midday of modernity, entering into the afternoon of Christianity, where very different virtues, very different kinds of an institution is going to be called for, where humility, dialogue, discernment, are going to be so much more important than in the morning of our great certainties and so on. Francis spoke last year about synodality as the church embarking on a journey to rediscover the word together, walking together, discussing together, taking responsibility together, he says, for a communitarian discernment, just as the first apostles did. It's about learning a new way of living relationships, listening to one another, hearing and following the voice of the spirit. And he ends up by saying, we want to contribute together to build a church where everyone feels at home, where no one is excluded. That word of the gospel that's so important, everyone. There are no first, second or third class Catholics, altogether everyone, todos. So I want to say that synodality, and I've seen this in the last two years, flawed as it is, and by the way, we're at the beginning of this long journey, but I've seen how this has already become real within the church. The significant role of lay people, of religious, of men and women, all engaged in this process together. It was very vivid in the assembly in October, as I'm sure we'll get on to. And that through this process, there is a growing clarity about the church, which Khalik is attempting to describe and Francis is pointing to. The church, which is capable of evangelizing, of being having a mission to contemporary society above all, through accompaniment of the seekers. And the whole enlarge your tent, which is coming from the synod, seems to me to being put flesh on this deep intuition of Francis's. There's been a lot of focus on certain celebrity issues, the female diaconate and so on. But I can tell you now that the synod isn't designed to resolve those questions. And in fact, we're going to shortly have an announcement from Rome, which is going to identify, I think, 10 priority issues, which will be studied by commissions. They will be, as it were, taken out from the Synod, because the Synod needs to concentrate in October on synodality itself. So I'm not saying that these issues are not the fruit of the Synod, and they aren't going to result in changes, but it's, the Synod isn't a mechanism for resolving those questions. What it is, is a mechanism for allowing us to travel together in the tensions around some of those issues and to hear what the Spirit is saying. And I want to just give you one very concrete example, and I'll try and keep it short because I know I'm out of time now. 
And it seems to me a very striking example, which will be familiar to you. I mentioned earlier that there were two kinds of main tension at the moment in the church. One of them between conservatives, progressives, left and right, and the other within a multipolar church, a, a culturally diverse global church. In terms of the first, you can express this as a tension between truth and mercy. The first, as it were, wanting to stress the truth of Catholic doctrine, the need for this to be clearly communicated and defended in a society in which that is called into question. And those who rather would want to emphasize the inclusion of all in the love and mercy of God. Now, interestingly, this has emerged as a key issue in the Synod. I can remember writing this in the Synod report for England and Wales, that we dream of a church that more fully lives a Christological paradox, that on the one hand, the church boldly proclaims its authentic teaching, but at the same time offers a witness of radical inclusion and acceptance through its pastoral and discerning accompaniment. Now, that phrase, the reason I quote it with a little bit of forgivable pride is that that phrase made it into the continental stage, the global synthesis document, and it's lasted all the way through to the working document for last October's assembly. And it formed, I think, a very fruitful part of the discussion in October. The reason I raise it is that the key example that was often given of this was homosexuality was the reception, the, the, the recognition of gay people and their relationships and their love, which, as you know, for large parts of the world is completely unacceptable to even talk about and is seen as an imposition of the West. So this, was, came, this was, has been a theme of the Synod, has been thrown up by the Synod. And how does the Pope respond with fiducia supplicans, which allows for the blessing of gay people, not of their unions, but of the people themselves, to understand that gay people are blessable even in their relationships. In they, when they call you know, on God's mercy and God's grace, the church assures them that that's there for them. A major, major document, which I think brilliantly holds together this tension in a way that other churches in the Christian world have not been able to. The Church of England in my country, for example, has been completely split apart over this question. But now look at what happens when fiducia supplicans you know, is taken up by Africa. Africa says, no, 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 this is unacceptable. Homosexuality is a scandal here. We cannot do this. And so there's a process where essentially the Africans are allowed to say, we won't do it. Because the greater scandal here is homosexuality, whereas the greater scandal in the West is the exclusion of gay people. These are cultural differences which need to be understood and accommodated. So my point is that this is one example of the way in which synodality is allowing us as a Catholic church, as a communion, to live in tension and to help that tension become fruitful rather than divisive, a source of growth rather than a source of confrontation, just like it was in Acts chapter 15. And the great thing about this is that it allows us more and more to be able to come out of ourselves, to transcend the institutional, psychological, mental boundaries of the long journey of our long relationship and battle and so on with modernity into this new era, which will allow us to present the gospel free from the integuments of the attachment of power in a way that allows us to enter into deep relationship and accompaniment of the seekers, the nuns, the, the, the Zacchaeuses of the new Galilee of our time, and so open us into that new Catholic future. Thank you very much. Austin, thank you very, very much. Um, much to think for. Unfortunately, unlike the bishops in a parasita, um, we can't clap here, but if we did, I'm sure there would be a, a robust round of applause um, for for your presentation. And thank you very much for. Um, yes, Austin, um, I put in the chat. Um, I'm a woman religious, and what we're discovering is uh, people aren't entering religious life, and we are in essence dying. But what we also discover is that um, our we don't own the charism. Uh, that we have, that we're finding it in people beyond us. So my question is your thoughts about how we can encourage people to discover the charisms within them and to live them out, to build up the church. Yeah, thanks so much, Sister Barbara. I look, you know, the, the, what's happening at the moment with the religious orders seems to me, again, a big part of this sign of the times 
uh, to which we need to respond as a church. And one of the great paradoxes, one might say, it's a very Christian paradox, is that just at the moment that so many particularly apostolic orders are, are shrinking so fast, is the very moment when the church, broadly speaking institutionally, is seeking from the religious orders the wisdom of their own synodal traditions, because it's actually the religious orders that have safeguarded these processes of discernment and so on. So I would just say, you know, uh, there isn't an easy answer to your question, but just to say that maybe there's something in this fruitful death idea, which is so much at the heart of our faith, that there is this dying if you like, the, the great era of a certain kind of religious apostolic activity uh, may well be coming to an end, precisely that the wisdom, the fruits of, of what the Spirit has done in that tradition can be then shared with the wider church. And uh, In Wounded Shepherd, you talk about lay people, especially uh, being specially trained in listening. Do you have any update on this? Um, thanks, James. Yeah, well, I, I did. I talked a lot about, well, in Buenos Aires, they talk about the apostolate of the ear, you know, this development of the listening ministry. And uh, it just seems to me crucial for all the reasons particularly spelt out in, in Halleck's book, um, that we need to become just much better as a church at, at this kind of very deep listening, <clears throat> which is what synodality uh, requires of us. I, I've been very struck, by the way, uh, and, and I, I, you know, I don't know the US church as well as obviously I know the church over here, but I've been very struck by how this process, synodality, has thrown up a new kind of ministry in the church. I'm, I'm really kind of deeply convinced of this. And it is the role of, and they are, by the way, mostly women, I think. I think women have a kind of natural proclivity for this. But these facilitators and oh, moderators, facilitators and moderators who can enable these processes of deep listening and can you know include people and can I, I think this is a this is a, a whole new ministry for the church and so many people have said to me in this process how much they need or, or did I know of you know good facilitators who could enable these processes within organizations so I think if I'm to look to the future I would say uh, 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 this is a major growth area within the church a new ministry a new calling which I think many people and particularly women are called to So we have a, a question. Um, what what do you see coming next? Uh, so post October, twenty twenty four, what do you see um, Pope Francis inviting the church to after that? I think it's very possible that the concluding document of the October assembly uh, will show that there is a very clear convergence behind the synodal conversion of the church. So in other words, because I think we've already seen it from the October assembly, where we had an extraordinary mixture, I mean, amazingly diverse mixture of people in the room, you know, from all different cultures, parts of the church, left and right and so on. And yet the one thing that they kind of agreed on was the importance of this journey together. So that the document itself, which captures both the disagreements, but also the, the convergences in the assembly, received an overwhelming, you know, 95% plus approval voting. Each paragraph was voted on. You know, the kinds of majorities that we had at Vatican II, which reflect this remarkable consensus. And I think that's because actually what the document was expressing is that this, and they say very clearly in the document, synodality belongs to the ancient tradition of the church and it's the future of the church. And so there is this broad agreement. So I think what we're going to end up with in October is a vision of this, if sorry to use the word, but the synodalization of the church, a vision for how that can happen concretely and why it's so important. And then I think it's very possible that Pope Francis will simply say, great, go and do it. You know, I mean, there may be an apostolic exhortation of some sort, but in a sense, he would be ratifying it and saying, well, this is, this is the fruit of this extraordinary three-year process. Now, you know, it's up to you, the local church now, to go and do it. And this document would have an amazing authority behind it because it would be the fruit of the consensus of this three-year process culminating in two synods of bishops. And therefore, again, you know, you can immediately see, well, this is a very different kind of a document with, invested with a very particular kind of authority. So this is pure speculation on my part. Uh, but if you ask me what I think is going to happen will be that. 
I think a lot of people will be disappointed that there isn't a sort of move on, you know, that certain doctrines that are held up as, as, as necessary to change or indeed questions of ministry and ordination and so on. There'll be an awful lot of disappointment from lots of different groups, uh, you know, who are hoping for particular outcomes. But as Francis says in Let Us Dream, if you come into a synodal process, if you come out of a synodal process deeply disappointed, it could be that you hoped to win something. <laughs> you know, and when you didn't win it, you're disappointed. And in fact, you've you've closed yourself off to what the spirit is actually doing. I found that very challenging when he said that to me, when, when, when he puts that in Let Us Dream. And I think a lot of people will experience that kind of disappointment, but I think they will fail to see the bigger thing that's happening, which I've been trying to spell out in this talk. Thank you. So we have a, a, a question about the, the Pope recently um, promulgated a document directed to the theological school in Rome saying that theology has to be done differently for this new era in the church. Um, any comments on that or any, any trajectories that you see about how doing theology in this new era of the church will differ? Yeah, and I've, I've got to tread on slightly careful <laughs> ground here because I'm a theological expert at the Synod. That's how I'm described. And therefore, I'm I'm working with a lot of professional theologians who I, by the way, deeply admire and many of whose work I've has been very influential on me. But I would say overall that theology has not yet caught up with, I would say, with Francis. But I would say that it, haven't, it hasn't yet caught up with synodality. And that too many theologians are still you know, trapped in what I might call a kind of a modern era mindset, uh, where there's a sort of fascination with, you know, the beautiful rational ideas and so on. And also a language which, is, of course, is very often very specialized and very abstract. What Francis is inviting us to do in this document, Ad Theologium Promovendum, but also in um, Veritatis Gaudium, his document, of, I think it was a 2017 to universities is to understand that theology is at the service of faith and at the service of the people of God. <laughs> and that, that, and I think in a synodal sense, what theologians are called to do is rather than prepare, you know, papers, a bit like at Vatican II, you had these kind of pariti. And, I, you know, I, I have noticed this, by the way, in the synod, some theologians were expecting that their role would be that of these pariti at Vatican II. You know, drawing up beautiful documents that are then discussed and implemented and so on. I think the role of the theologian is reversed in this. In other words, we start from the lived in faith experience of the people of God, and then we ask the theologians to then reflect on that, make sense of it in the light of theology and in light of the church's tradition, and formulate it or reformulate it in a way that is at the service then of the people of God. And I think that's the kind of switch that I think Francis is inviting us to make, He's made that call quite clearly in these documents, but I'm yet to see it, I think, really being taken up. And I say that even in the Synod, I think there's been a, you know, the theologians have struggled to find the place of theology within the synodal process. And that's not all their fault, but I think a lot of it does reflect a certain limitation of a certain kind of mindset. There we uh, go. I won't, be, I, I won't be invited back now. <laughs> <laughs> Gretchen raised her hand. Gretchen, you had a question. Uh, yes, this is Bernie. Um, I can't find the chat box, but I put it in the question and answer. Many in U.S. dioceses, including my own, uh, are now preparing for October. Bishop Flores earlier this year sent out two questions that came from uh, the Vatican. Mm -hmm. My diocese is not dealing with that. Many other dioceses are not either. So how will the results of what happens in October uh, in Rome be accepted by our diocese? Yeah, this is one of the questions I get most often asked, uh, which is a complaint that my parish, my diocese, my bishop isn't interested or is even opposed to the synod. And and that's the truth. The truth is that many, many are opposed to it or don't understand it or feel deeply threatened by it. And actually, because of the ecclesiology of the church, there's not an awful lot we can do about that, because actually everything does depend so much at least on on the bishop uh, and on the priest i mean if the priest doesn't want to see it happen in the parish it's not going to happen and i think we have to just accept that reality and i think be patient and i would say that that's my message to you as well yeah you know, there will be another bishop after your bishop <laughs> the priest after your 
priest. That's what the Jesuits always say. You know, you, you've got a bad superior, you wait for a new one, you might have to wait 20 years. But actually, there is something about understanding that this is a patient process uh, and, and that it's, it's going to take time. It's an organic process. What I think is important, though, is to understand that there is nothing to stop you, you, you all, doing synodal things. You know, what does it cost you? <laughs> How hard is it to organize a conversation in the spirit which takes seriously a question of discernment for your parish or your group? There's nothing anybody can do to stop you doing that. And if you do do it, you're aligning yourself with this global process. And you're learning the skills that are so necessary. So I would just say, if you're frustrated that your bishop, you know, isn't behind this or is even opposed, or your priest or whatever, if you really feel you're called to develop it, do it. You know, and I think that's the message from Rome. It's the message from the Pope. Um, but I think things will change, and I think one of the things that's going to change is that we're going to see more and more diocesan pastoral councils and deanery councils and you know, discernment processes, conversations in the spirit. It's just going to become part of Catholic life. In, tw in 10, 15 years, 20 years' time, we'll all look back and say, well, it was all so obvious. Um, but right now, there is tremendous resistance. And I think particularly, and I know I'm aware that I'm addressing association you know, originally of priests here, but I think for the clergy, this is tough. You know, many of them have been formed in a particular understanding of themselves and their role. They feel the loss of that role and they see synodality as threatening it rather than enabling it. And I think, again, you know, we have to understand that. And I think synodality has to be better at understanding also where priests are in this process. Uh, but my overall message is be patient and you'll be amazed how the spirit ultimately will break through. Jim Ruck uh, yeah. raised his hand. Jim? Uh, Bernie had a question similar to mine, but uh, uh, I just add maybe uh, a question for you around the role of suffering in all this. Um, being patient is one thing, but seeing the possibilities uh, and realizing they're not being uh, acted upon does bring suffering. And I'm sure uh, Pope Francis has had more than his share, but perhaps you could just say a word or two about that. Yeah, I mean, of course, um, paciencia in Latin, I think it means suffering. Uh, you know, pa patience is suffering. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And I suppose ultimately what patience is about is trusting uh, that um, the action that I do now or the hope that I have in my heart or the action that I perform now uh, may not count for very much or appear not to have any effect, but I trust that actually it will because it's aligned with God's kingdom, with the spirit and so on. And I think that's the kind of patience that I'm talking about. It's it's not about sort of just giving up and just accepting that nothing's going to happen. It's about acting now, even though you have no support for it and you can't see immediately kind of where it's going. But I do appreciate, of course, the degree of um, of impatience and frustration that there is in the church, <laughs> you know, with so many things that are happening. But I've learned a lot from Francis in understanding kind of how he conducts the church, that he understands the importance of revelation, you know, the way the spirit acts, the way God acts in history is to throw things into relief, to expose things. And then we can see what's happening and we can then choose. And that, you know, we don't achieve the ends that we want to achieve by, by force, by power, by persuasion but rather by allowing this to work itself out. And I think there's something about that, about the patient respect, patience and respect for the way the spirit works uh, in our time and in our, indeed in our own lives, I think has a lot to teach us. So you, you mentioned uh, third ecumenism. Uh, there's a question in our chat. What's your perspective on how the ecumenical community is seeing and receiving the church's efforts at synodality? Thanks, John. It's, it's a great question. And of course, the answer is with huge interest. And this is very obvious. I mean, at the Synod Assembly last uh, last October, we had many, many what, are, what were known as fraternal delegates, and they were representing the other churches. And of course, they had extremely important experiences to share. But I also want to mention uh, an event which happened here in the UK, in Durham, in the north of the country, the University of Durham, which has developed a, something called receptive ecumenism. It's kind of a speciality of that of that university. And receptive ecumenism has a lot in common with synodality because it's about 
receiving the gifts that the receiving the gifts that the spirit has poured out on others and how i can understand what the spirit is doing and receive that for myself okay and the meeting that i attended i was invited to attend was on synodality itself in the christian tradition so all the different churches there were six you know so for anglicans methodists baptists pentecostals quakers um, i must have missed one out you know we're all sharing about how they make decisions handle discernment divisions and all the rest of it in their own traditions and it was completely fascinating to realize just how incredibly different these traditions were and yet you could see that the spirit has done something in each of them but various of them said because the meeting was convened by the catholics and in reference to francis and this process only the catholic church could have convened a meeting like this only the catholic church is capable of convening all the churches and asking them to recover, restore, reinvigorate their own traditions of synodality. And I think many people have had a vision in the future, and I don't think it's that far off, in which the Pope convenes a synodal assembly in Rome and invites all the Christian churches to take part, not a deliberative assembly, but as an assembly in which actually people are discerning together the challenges of contemporary society, which all the churches face you know the church is all facing the same challenges the idea is that we could do it together from our understanding that the spirit has done different things in all of our traditions so i think ecumenically this is a very very important synodality this journey of synodality is not just for the catholic church it's for the whole christian church so in our chat uh somebody shared an observation that uh, and here at least in the united states there's a contingent of younger Catholics who are attracted to the traditional um, Latin mass. Uh, it's not out of a sense of nostalgia, but for whatever reason, they find it attractive. And there are some in leadership in the United States to see that as a, a movement of the spirit and uh, see that as a direction for the future. But that proclivity toward the traditional Latin mass doesn't have the same interest in synodality. Again, I don't know if that's an experience beyond the United States, but would you offer any comments or observations on that phenomenon? Yeah, well, I, I raised it in my talk as an example of, of what Halik would call bad aging. You know, in other words, you've got this kind of midlife crisis that we're going through, and the invitation is to enter into the afternoon. And just as in our own lives, you know, when we enter middle age, you get people, as it were, trying to recover their youth, you know, by 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 going back to the security and the privileges that they think that they've lost. And I think there's a lot of that in traditionalism. And I think, look, you know, I mean, the search for identitarian Catholicism, as it's sometimes called, it's not just in Catholicism. All the religions are at the moment experiencing an upsurge of what I might call identity, uh, 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 des a desire for a sort of strong, assertive identity in which we're allowed, we feel strong, we feel we've got the truth uh, and so on. And of course, what does it reflect? And, and, and traditionalism is about saying, well, you know, the glories of the church you know, in the 16th century that's we, we want to lock the church there forever and say that is the church look all this reflects the anxiety and insecurity um in our society as a result of the huge changes that are afoot driven by technology and by social change which produces tremendous anxiety a feeling of seasickness and uh, and of course makes people who are spiritually weak susceptible to national populists uh, and Christian nationalists and indeed the lure of identitarian you know uh, movements of, and fundamentalist movements of many sorts but you know, having having said all that I, I actually do think that we need to understand that traditionalists particularly young people are also in a way they're like the nuns you know they are searching for something uh, in their case, though, they've decided to go for the security and the fundamentalism where the nun, where the spiritual se se seeker doesn't want to make a commitment. But actually, I would say that the traditionalist commitment is an extremely insecure one because it's a commitment to an ideology, not to a faith. It's not rooted in a in spirituality. And therefore, it's just like anybody who gets caught up in any ideology. We have to listen to that person we have to understand what's in their heart what they're looking for we have to above all understand the anguish that leads them to this um and that's why synodality is so important you know we need to listen to everybody uh and, and that includes the traditionalists and i'm proud of the fact that, that you know certainly in this country 
we very much invited the traditionalists to be part of the synodal processes, and they were, and they complained about Francis, and they complained about Traditionis Custodis, and we put it in our national report. We said, you know, these people are, you know, they're annoyed with Francis for these reasons and so on. And they were actually astonished because they had said from the beginning, oh, this is all a liberal stitch up and you're going to ignore us. But, and they said, well, yeah, okay, we, you've listened to us. You know, that's great. And as a result of that listening, I think we all understand much more how they feel about traditionis custodis, you know. Uh, and so uh, yeah, we have to recognize, listen, see people uh, because we're all subjects. Thank you. So there's a Question, a couple of questions in the chat that relate to, um, you know, that your your talk is the synodality as the legacy. Legacy suggests that it was something that will endure beyond the person's life. Um, you know, uh, do do you see, uh, you know, in the next conclave, uh, some type of reactionary pendulum swinging the other way kind of thing? Is is this going to be, uh, you know, a uh, one and done, or do, you, or do you really see this as something enduring beyond the uh, pontificate of Pope Francis? Well, absolutely the latter. I think it's the, you know, a, a genie that's come out of the bottle that can't be put back in. It's it's a, a journey without a, a reverse gear. Um, and I say this with confidence because I've seen over the last 10 years how the bishops have grown into synodality. You know, they've un they've come to understand it. I saw it particularly in the family synod. I have a whole chapter in Wounded Shepherd on what happened in the family synod. And, you know, these bishops went into it saying, look, I don't know how we can reconcile these two things. And, you know, and they came out of it the other end going, wow, you know, this was transformative. And I think having experienced it and having experienced, so they've seen the spirit at work, they've seen how it can work um, to open new horizons for the church, but they've also understood the value of, of themselves as bishops being able to speak freely, you know, uh, because they couldn't before under the previous synods. It was all controlled very much from the Vatican. Uh, and so uh, having discovered parresia, <laughs> you know, apostolic courage to speak bold, because Pope Francis said to them at the beginning of the family synod, there are two rules here you've got to understand. Speak boldly, listen humbly. Those two things, you know, are the key to the synodality. And they did discover that they could speak boldly and freely. And, and having as it were, got that, they certainly don't want to go back on it. Now, there is a lot of resistance, there's a lot of questions about the role of uh, non-bishops in the Synod Assembly. You know, the, 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 they were referred to us, we were referred to, well, I wasn't a member, but the non, they were referred to as not endowed with the Episcopal Munus. You know, what status does do they have in the decision-making processes of a Synod of Bishops? There are lots of questions. But again, the Synod Assembly last October, I would say most of the bishops said much, much better that we do it this way with the participation of 25% non-bishops than we than the previous model, they said, which didn't work. So what I see is enthusiasm for this from the bishops, and I see it particularly in the College of Cardinals, uh, and I don't see how our next conclave is going to reverse that. Uh, I think quite the opposite. I think the desire will be to develop and consolidate this journey that we're on. Well, uh, we're at the point where we're going to shift gears and move toward our closing. I, again, personally, and I think on mm -hmm. behalf of all of the people here, thank you very much, uh, not only for your time, your expertise, but the great uh, enthusiasm and clarity with which you shared uh, synodality as Pope Francis's legacy. So I just invite you, uh, any closing remark, uh, and, you know, the people remember best what they heard first and what they heard <laughs> last. So what do you want us to remember as we as we leave this afternoon? Well, thank you for again for the for the privilege of uh, of having me with you and uh, of listening to me. And I'm just um, uh, deeply aware because I do know I've been to the U.S. Church many times and and, and admire the U.S. Church enormously. Um, and but I do think that the challenges that you face are just like the ones we face are enormous. And we are at this we are at this uh, crossroads. We're at a turning place. The crisis. It's a time of choice. And um, and that choice is opening a, a itself up with ever greater clarity. I guess I would just invite you to there's there's a phrase which Francis uses in Letter Stream when he quotes the poet Holderlin, German poet. And the phrase he says of Holderlin's, he, the Pope, has kept by his side throughout his life. And it's he's always kind of gone back to it. 
And the phrase is this, where the danger is, there grows the saving power. In other words, precisely in the place of the threat is where we will discover God's mercy and grace waiting to overflow. So that there is no reason for despondency. There is no reason for pessimism. The, the crisis itself that we are in is what is showing us the future to which the Spirit is calling us. And just to return to that idea that this is what they did at a Aparecida, rather than lament and condemn, they discerned and reformed, and they opened themselves up to a new horizon. And that's what I hope for our church, but I hope also for every one of you this Lent and this Easter. And thank you again for having me. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I, I don't want to repeat the wonderful invocation of Rick Gosser, but uh, his invocation of the spirit, we hope that it comes upon you, uh, continues to guide you, bless you in your important work uh, in the church in England and the world. And, and as you prepare for the next assembly of the Synod in October of 24.